Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have John Cameron, author of Rewire, Rekill, and a development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation. Tyler Kosky, chairman of the El Dorado Libertarian Party, El Dorado County Libertarian Party. Philip Perea, editor of uh, Minute Dot, and uh, a uh, investment uh, advisor and consultant, uh, whatever you call yourself these days. I don't want to get you in trouble by calling you the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, and we. Uh, we're, we're talking about the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of the, uh, uh, the Trump cabinet and Trump appointments other, other than cabinet. And uh, talking about the, uh, the good for a brief amount of time, because it is rel relatively brief. Well, actually, there's a couple of, of good guys. One, I think, is the uh, director of Health and Human Services, a guy by the name of Tom Price. He's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and an early opponent uh, and a long, uh, very, a very vocal opponent of Obamacare. He's actually written some alternative, uh, a replacement for Obamacare, which, of course, the Democrats say, well, you don't like Obamacare, but you don't have a replacement. Well, he does. Uh, he will now be uh, heading up Health and Human Services. Uh, thoughts on, on Tom Price? I love him. Uh, and uh, just before we came on air, um, uh, Senator Paul introduced a, um, a replacement for Obamacare, and it's right out of the libertarian playbook where uh, Price has been very consistent, and it's all about um, uh, some of the major provisions are really having everything driven by the a an HSA program that allows one health to savings account. health savings account. And what Paul is proposing as of today is that one, uh, the amount that one can contribute uh, tax deductible is much higher, 5000 per person, but also that the, day, uh, the amount to contribute can be unlimited and also tax favored since it's growing tax free and taken out tax free for qualified purchases. On top of that, Paul is proposing that uh, there will be a two year period during which people with pre existing conditions may uh, continue to gain insurance, uh, and in addition, all of those group provisions. But crucially, it allows individuals to deduct whatever health insurance uh, premiums that they pay, uh, which previously had only been available to the employer. So you're taking away a huge incentive of forcing people into an employer situation. So in altogether, it, w it is a, a proposal that um, was right out of Tom Price's book, as you said, he literally wrote the book on this. And in this case, uh, it would be very difficult to find any anyone who um, is a fan of Obamacare, it would be very difficult to find any objection to what uh, Paul has just put out there. In the sense that it would uh, uh, leave no one uninsured? Correct. And it would be affordable. And when we say no affordable. one un uninsured, I think Paul Ryan said it best. It would leave everyone with access. So if one chose, uh, the IRS just put out its statistics uh, with uh, Obamacare signups and all of that. How many people claimed exemptions? They just didn't want it, and they qualified for it. Uh, who paid fines, and who didn't check the box? And altogether, it was about 26 million people. In other words, two-thirds of the uninsured in 2010 preferred to remain uninsured. So will that uh, option change? Uh, you know, will 26 million people choose to be uninsured? Perhaps. But what it will do is it will create a marketplace. Of course, there were all the things about selling across state lines, expanded scope of practice, all of that's in there. Will there, will there be changes uh, as far as uh, uh, lightening up on the uh, requirements of what needs to be and doesn't need to be included in a health insurance policy? Yes. And uh, obviously the first thing that goes away, uh, line one, is the individual mandate and the mandate that employers provide. So what it's really doing is it's taking it out of the, um, the institutional form of health insurance and health care to every individual having that choice still having the ability to be assured under pre-existing conditions. And one thing that I thought was amazing in this plan that um, uh, was a huge thing for the work that I did once upon a time in health insurance is that so many people, uh, hairdressers, realtors, uh, were excluded from being considered as groups, uh, which meant that they, they therefore could not get group health insurance. 
Well, the Paul provision says anybody can form an association. Uh, so we might form an association of, uh, you know, thinkers. Sort of like, like credit unions can form exactly. an association around any, any uh, organizing principle that they, they, they choose. Exactly. So, but, but, um, and still, question, can, can an, uh, a company still um, um, write off the expense of, of uh, health insurance for their employees if they choose to? To the degree that they are actually paying the premium. However, the, the to company. the degree that the individual chooses, the employee chooses to pay the premium or has some part of the premium for which they are liable, which is more often the case now, that the employee will also be able to deduct their portion which of the Which in premium. the past they couldn't. Yeah. And one can it's choose between idea. one or the other. It's a wonderful idea because then, you know, basically um, health providers are going to have to compete for the business instead of the Where does it leave uh, Medicare and Medicaid? Medicare, of course, is the program which is the uh, most, uh, most the, the entitlement program most in danger of going broke soonest. Well, it doesn't make any change to the provisions of Medicare or Medicaid, but what they have suggested is uh, to block grant the thing. And so Paul's You're talking about plan, Medicaid in that case. Uh, both. Both, okay. Uh, and and what, Paul is, what Paul is proposing doesn't in any way prevent any state from augmenting a program. Uh, in addition, there's a nice provision in there that allows doctors to write off losses to un, uh, people who can't pay their bills. So in effect, it becomes a, um, a de facto way to encourage them to do pro bono work. Uh, so, so, write, so know, where this would go ultimately is money in, money out. You're talking out. about writing it off against their tax bill or? Against their own earnings. Oh, so okay, um, yeah. if someone comes in and uh, you know, has treatment but can't pay the bill, the doctor can say, well, the value of my services was whatever it was, $10,000. And subtract that from his income exactly. uh, earned it. So here, here's a question on that. Is it, is it uh, market-based? Um, so they, the services are valued at what, the, what they would charge an insurance company for those services, or are they based on what they would charge? Well, you can see what would happen is it would absolutely become market-based because the insurance company is, after all, a market. Mm. So what's really going to happen, and this is a huge benefit uh, to, for instance, my son, uh, because what you're doing is you're transitioning the society from a, um, an entitlement system, regardless of what it costs, as if we could go into a grocery store and fill up our carts at $50, regardless of what we put in that cart, mm -hmm. which is with the system we have now. Now it's saying, look, we're going to make every provision to allow you to deduct from your income what you are paying for health insurance and what you're paying for your care, which gives everybody the incentive to say to the doctor, well, is there a generic version of that pill? You know, uh, do I really need this? So that there will be surgery? some transparency on what things actually cost mm -hmm. for the, for the it patient. It will be inevitable because yeah. people will have the sense that they are using yeah. their own money. Yeah. Uh, is there anything in there that would reform uh, FDA uh, provisions as far as uh, making uh, the safe and effective, taking away the uh, effective and let FDA ch uh, judge it safety only and let the patient judge uh, effectiveness? No. Uh, it, that is going in, a, in that direction regardless because of what happened with all of the generic, uh, all the drug companies that just jacked up their prices. A lot of the pressure, especially on the EpiPen, which was so famously, yeah. uh, uh, one of the things that came out of that, that was that there were a number of other products that had been refused by the FDA. So part of the reform to get drug prices lower was to increase competition and to um, mm -hmm. accelerate approval ratings. So for instance, last week, with regards to the EpiPen, there is another company that is offering the same thing in a generic model at $109, which is comparable for a two-pack, which is comparable to what Milan was charging before government, you know, had just said writing a blank check for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to another uh, good appointment uh, is uh, the uh, Secretary of Labor, Andrew Puzder, the uh, uh, CEO of Carl's Jr., uh, an opponent of minimum wage, among other uh, politically incorrect uh, stands. I Go ahead. I'm, I'm in favor of this guy for one reason. I don't know a whole lot about him. Others, he's a successful entrepreneur. Is, is anybody that uh, uh, has ever watched television and seen a Carl's Jr. commercials knows that they're kind of titillating. 
uh, and uh, kind of they they um, um, feature risque. a lot of risque, a lot of semi-naked women eating uh, burgers. Is nothing to do with, and it's kind of a it's kind of a lighthearted approach to marketing, and I like it. And and everything I've seen, any interview with the guy is always laughing and having a good time. Um, he's run a magnificent business, and if anybody starts out with the clear understanding that any time you put a barrier to people entering the labor force by creating an artificial price for unskilled uh, labor that has no experience and has not proven itself, you, you take away people's ability to enter the marketplace. And that's what the minimum wage does. The, all the minimum wage does is push up the price of all goods and services. And, and well, exclude, and, and, and and exclude encourages people. robots. And what did yeah. happen um, this last year uh, is that uh, they're calling it a restaurant depression, mm. and it only accelerated in December. Uh, so if you think that people did not look at the higher prices, and I'm, you know, I'm a Carl's Jr. guy. I, they used to, you know, the, the the prices went up about twenty percent. It was the difference between shopping there and not shopping there. Mm. So if what really happened is that there, there is no question that now in the data we can see, and it was particularly bad in December, which is, which is usually a great month for restaurants, uh, it was particularly bad, so that you could see that the effect of the combination of the Obamacare and the increased minimum wage, particularly uh, affecting the restaurant industry, absolutely had the economic effect that you would expect. They had to raise their prices. People stop coming in. Moving on to more good under the uh, the uh, Obama cabinet picks and uh, and uh, other appointees. This one excites me a, a whole lot. It's the uh, uh, director of Office of Management and Budget, a congressman by the name of Mick Mulvaney, who is a is famous for being a uh, a proponent of deep spending cuts in the federal budget. Well, the question is uh, which. Part of the budget, are they, is he wanting to cut? Well, obviously, when politicians talk about cutting budget, they're talking about the discretionary budget. Nobody, least of all Trump, is talking about any cuts where they really need to be done in the non-discretionary budget, which is uh, Social Security, Medicare, uh, and so forth. But when it comes, to, and, and that's two thirds of the budget. So, you, point taken, they're talking about cutting the discretionary budget, which includes defense and all of the three-letter agencies. But that's a start. Gotcha. Well, yeah, I think we could, let's just say that we only choose to fund the, the letter agencies that occur in the second part of the alphabet. You know, everything from M on we fund, and everything from A through L we don't fund. I mean, that would be a good start, and it would make as much sense as the rules that these alphabet agencies enforce. So why don't we just suggest that? No, I, I think any any... Anytime you get someone in government who repeatedly says, um, we don't need to spend this money, he understands the concept of wealth. And apparently they don't teach that in these government schools, that wealth is created. You, can, you can't really create real wealth by printing money uh, or by incurring debt, at least not long term. If you combine, now I'm not saying it's going to have to happen overnight, if he's really serious about this Trump guy, uh, putting people in place who want to cut a, an overwhelming, massive regulatory environment. I don't know what the number is. Maybe Philip or, or, yeah. or maybe Tyler. It, you it, know, it, it's a big, it's it's a big number. If you think about Obama presenting roughly a four trillion dollar budget, uh, roughly two trillion of that is discretionary. So the Congress puts out one point three, and they approve that. But at the end of the day, it's very close, about one point eight, one point nine trillion in the discretionary side. What Trump particularly seems to be leading to is the idea that all of these federal departments are redundant, and we're getting rid of them. Uh, At least from a functional standpoint. He's putting people cabinet positions that are not in charge of reforming them. They're in charge of eliminating them. They're people who were... Or making them ineffectual because it would take a congressional act to get rid of the Department of and Education And that's why I think you know, the combination of defunding mm -hmm. uh, uh, and people putting in position, people who really don't like the agencies which they had, they're on record in that way. 
that you can eliminate, um, and the thing that might surprise people about Trump is that he has really taken some of these defense contractors to task. So yeah, you know, famous for tweeting uh, against uh, Lockheed Martin and the was Boeing. it the F thirty five Boeing against Air Force One. Yeah, it's what what's hilarious to me is that because they've been, I don't know if they still do, they used to have cost plus, they had the craziest contracts in the world. Basically, if they did had a cost overrun, they would just go say we need more money because we had a cost overrun. If you tried that in, in the, the unless you put in a, a change in, change in your project on your construction plan and asked for a change in it, and you came back and said, well, I miscalculated this, this bid I did to build your building or to build your tractor, or somebody would say, Guess what? You're giving that tractor to me to loss, buddy. But in the defense industry, that didn't happen. And it's amazing to me that through a simple tweet to Boeing and a simple tweet to Lockheed Martin, whatever, Grumman, and all the rest of them were combined, they said, oh, yeah, we, we, can, we can lower the price of that Air Force One, Air Force One for you. And, oh, yeah, and, uh, we might be able to deliver that, <laughs> that F-35 a little cheaper. We'll, 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 we'll get work our, on it. We'll and get the real our short telling, pencils. The, the real telling. The real telling st statistic is that they have all reported their earnings in the last couple of weeks, and all of them have given forward guidance saying that we don't think we're going to make as much money last next year as we think as we made last year. That's real. <laughs> Actually, I, I remember I can't remember if it was Lockheed or Martin, uh, one of those defense contractor, and they gave it a. Uh, they were talking to their investors, uh, and their stockholders, and, and they had blatantly said. We don't need war to be profitable, uh, and that was obviously a, you know a sales tactic to make sure people were, were still buying their stocks. But I don't think that even if you you know cut military funding, they, they they're corporations. They know how to make money. Well, they're always the, gonna find ways. The other thing that's kind of a this America first business is that Trump throughout the campaign was the um, uh, the most dovish when it came to the wars. It was like, why are we Why are we there? Why are we over here? Why are we bombing Syria and Libya and everything else? Well, it's interesting. He was dovish when it came to the Middle East, dovish obviously when it came to Russia. Not so much when it comes to China, which we don't have a shooting war with or the potential of a shooting war with, but he, he's doing stuff on the trade front that could lead to war there. I'm not sure. That's a kind of a separate discussion, but what the point that I was getting to was that, uh, you know, if we spend a trillion dollars on war, 600 billion that we know about, and another 400 billion, that's sort of in the, um, in the other mandatory category from the OMB. Uh, let's say it's a trillion dollars. Uh, it looks like Trump is leaning in that direction of saying, look, you know, it shouldn't cost us this much to begin with. And second of all, I'm not so interested in being in these places, particularly when he's got all that leverage with oil. You know, he's released all of that. Uh, uh, he's given Blackwater and the Keystone. He's letting the, the the frackers have their way. Well, yeah, no, uh, he's he's given he's turned around the uh, uh, the Obama uh, uh, turned down of the Keystone pipeline. He's uh, said let the Dakota pipeline go forward. He's. Uh, uh, obviously in a position where he's going to say to the frackers, you know, gung-ho, carry, carry on. Uh, that hasn't happened yet, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it will. Well, what's happened there is there's a count that comes out from Baker Hughes, one of the major yeah. names in oil services, and they produce their weekly rig count. Right. Uh, at the top of the cycle in 2014, we were operating just under 1,000 rigs. At the bottom of the cycle, when the oil prices collapsed, we were operating under 500 rigs. We are now back up to 700, and they are spiking. So the market is doing what it's doing, but that's also taking the leverage away from the Middle East. It really does beg the question, what in the world are we doing over there? Here, question. Uh, um, you think that it's a coinky dink that the uh, Clinton Foundation is no longer getting um, 15, 20 million dollar checks from um, sheiks uh, who's sitting on top of oil fields um, because the the whole Clinton administration um, didn't happen. Uh, didn't happen, and the the Clinton Foundation and its interconnectedness to the idea that uh, you know whatever Americans do to bring oil out of the ground is inherently bad is now gone. Um, I think I think quite frankly, it looks to me that that the um, Arab world was buying lack of competition in the United States flat out just buying it and through that, their political and that, connections. That being one of the reasons why 
Hillary was such a such a, a warmonger when it came to Syria and Libya and other uh, Middle Eastern countries? I, in my opinion, I think it goes, uh, if we look at the yeah. geopolitical, it goes beyond the oil itself. Uh, because the U.S. has been number one, number two oil producer now for, and now number one because Russia has kind of cut back a little bit. We're just taking market share from the from the Russians and now OPEC like crazy. Uh, but what it really comes down to is the U.S. under the progressive Teddy Roosevelt empire philosophy has been to have military bases all around the world. You know, there's always a missile pointed at you. Wherever you are, there's a missile pointed at there's you. There's a meme going around the internet that says uh, it's a picture of the map of Russia. If Russia wasn't such a warmonger, why did they put their country so close to our bases? Exactly, <laughs> and there's a little more truth to that. Than, so, so the Which whole now idea we have troops is, in this Poland. is why we're in Iraq, because we can point at Iran, and we can point at Russia, and we can point at Afghanistan, and we can point at China, and they're all, all not so very far away from our range. So I really think that the underlying principle is, um, is empire. Trump seems to be saying, no, we don't care. So the other side of that uh, America first idea is really a return to Jeffersonian liberalism, Madisonian Monroe liberalism saying, look, we take care of our own. You don't know European wars. Well, now the European wars are Middle Eastern wars. Well, let's take a look at, at, at the, we talked about the good, let's take a look at the bad. And maybe, maybe it's not so bad under what you're saying, uh, Philip. We're talking about defense uh, appointment, the head of the Defense Department, General uh, James Mattis, who had had to get a, a waiver Is that because bulldog? he hadn't he hadn't been he hadn't been Which allowed bulldog? he hadn't been Kelly allowed or to Mattis? I don't remember he, he'd been too recent not recently enough retired in uh, order seven to, years he had yeah. been retired so. also yeah. known as the uh, Baron Saint of Chaos. Yeah, I, I mean, good, bad, or ugly uh, when it comes to the military, defense, James Mattis, Homeland Security, John Kelly, Marine General John Kelly, uh, CIA, Mike Pompeo. I, I would say um, Pompeo might be the least worst from one perspective. Um, but again, it depends on what, um, is Trump crazy or crazy like a fox? If you're going to have, I think we should just go ahead and change the, the name of the, um, the agency from instead of uh, the Department of Defense, Defense Department of War. And, and let's be obvious what it's there for. It's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there to wage war, but only a declared war, not all these undeclared wars that we're in. And only and, if it's necessary. And, and only it when absolutely necessary. It used to be called the War Department. Yeah. It used right. to be yeah. called War Department. <laughs> and they changed it to the Department of Defense, but then went away from defending the country and started sticking their nose in in the Empire Building you talked about. So if you're going to have somebody in charge of waging a winning war, put somebody who's basically that's their, their life. You know, if we're going to, uh, I'm a tough guy, I've been a tough guy, I've done this, um, and, and if we do it, we're going to win. And, and I think he could be crazy like a fox. Now, you know, the opposite side of that coin is he could just be crazy. So uh, I don't think we know yet. But well, I, think, I think if you're going to have uh, somebody in charge of something that's a real label should be, you know, Department of War, that it should be somebody who's good at waging a war, as long as they don't like waging war. Wouldn't that be an alternative fact, though? <laughs> <laughs> no, that you're, we're not talking about global warming yet. Yeah. <laughs> what, well, um, I'm sorry. Uh, well, what other options would, would we have had to pick for the Department of Defense or the Department of War in your case? Mm, Mahatma Gandhi? No, he's dead. Because no, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure James Mateus was also uh, Hillary Clinton's would probably have picked him as well. Hmm. I mean, I, I think that he's pretty much the only real, real option. I mean, I, I can't really think of any other generals. I don't really know that many, but I can't think of anything offhand that would be a good fit for that position. Do you One guys thing have that speaks well for Mattis is that um, his opponents speak very highly of him. Uh, he has the respect of his opponents. Is he uh, the one, the guy that said when he uh, addressed the troops that I'm, going, I'm glad to be serving with you? as yes. opposed to And he is known as um, the philosopher warrior. You know, he's kind of an esthete, uh, and he is known to be um, a kind of a Marcus Aurelius figure of where he is as um, thoughtful as he is military. So he's been very effective as a general, but he's also been the kind of person who has, you know, uh, shown real intellect. And on the other side of that, I need to ask two questions. He's a big supporter of NATO. 
and uh, supports the uh, Iran nuclear agreement. Are those which which those Trump doesn't neg negative uh, negatives or positives? Is NATO a good thing for us to be in this treaty where, in essence, an attack on is Poland part of NATO now? I think we Probably. have we have troops in Poland. Yeah. If if let's let's talk about why maybe the Russian bear would be upset if you were a Russian. If the Russians had troops in Mexico, would we find that a little disturbing? The answer would well, be, we hell did, yes. We, well, we did, did Cuba. Cuba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving on, moving on to, yeah. you, you bring up Russia, and we're talking about getting into the ugly, at least ugly in appearance, Rex Tillerson for Department of State. Rex Tillerson, the former CEO, or I think maybe he still is the CEO of, uh, of Exxon, Exxon Mobil, which has extensive dealings in Russia. Mm -hmm. And with all of the uh, the Russia phobe talk uh, during the election, is that not something that at least on the surface looks ugly as hell? Well, I think it's great, though. Okay. I mean, I, Why? I'm, well, I mean, it, it, um, if you're if you're thinking Russia is a problem, this is a guy who has negotiated contracts and understands dealing with the Russian mafia, the the oligarchs, and all the rest of that, um, and has managed to turn a profit doing it. You know, does that mean he's a sociopath, uh, or does that mean he he understands the enemy? You know, know the or enemy, knows how to drink or, vodka or pretend he's drinking vodka. And, <laughs> and so, or are they really the enemy? I mean, um, Putin. You know, he ran he ran what's used to be called the KGB. Well, he was in the KGB before the change. So, um, you know, very smart. Very powerful Russian nationalism. A lot of people have well, made. Well, Putin is a yeah. chess player. Obama okay. was a checkers player. And yeah. uh, the question is whether or not uh, Trump can play tiddlywinks. Well, I guess we'll find well, one out. Of, one of the interesting things well, he's got about Rex to help. is yeah. that um, uh, one of those things that's not generally known when Obama went into Iraq again. We were out of Iraq. Obama went into Iraq again to save those Christians on that mountaintop, if, if anybody recalls. Yeah. Well, what was on the other side of that mountaintop was what mattered, and it was Tillerson's oil wells. So if ISIS had gained that mountaintop, they would have been lobbing missiles right down into Exxon's oil wells. Uh, is that a problem for the Secretary of State to be that motivated to protect their oil wells? Uh, that's where I see the problem. That might be the ugly. Well, that's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on Libertarian Counterpoint on YouTube. Uh, and on uh, cable channels all over the place, sacramentoaccess.org uh, is uh, where you can watch it online at uh, uh, see, noon on Friday, uh, a, what the heck is it? Th 7 p.m. on Thursday, or 8 p.m. on Thursday, noon on Friday, and 4, 4 a.m. on Saturday. Channel 17 in Channel Sacramento. Channel 17 in yes. Sacramento. Thank you very much. We'll see you again next week. Yeah. As, as I think more and more about these guys, I mean, they're a 